I'll come before you today And there's just one thing that I want to say Thank you Lord Thank you Lord For all you've given to me For all the blessings that I can see Thank you Lord Thank you Lord With a grateful heart With a song of praise With an outstretched arm I will bless your name Thank you I just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For all you've done in My darkness and gave me your life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You took my sin and my shame. You took my sickness and healed all my pain. Thank you. Thank you, Lord With a grateful heart With a song of praise With an outstretched arm I will bless your name Thank you, Lord I just want to thank you, Lord thank I just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For providing for all our needs according to your will and giving us your kingdom. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. giving us our sins and giving us eternal life and sharing the glory of our Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. With a grateful heart, with a song of praise, with an outstretched arm, I will bless your name. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.
a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary. A sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. A sanctuary, pure and holy, try them through with thanksgiving. I'll be a living sanctuary. As we come to the time to remember the sacrifice of Jesus by taking communion, if you have any wine or juice or bread to represent the blood and body of Jesus Christ, I encourage you to get that ready. In John 13, Jesus gives a very familiar commandment, but I want to read it again here, 13, 34, and 35. Say, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. I've always thought this was a very interesting distinction, that this is how Jesus says that other people will know that we follow him, not by certain rituals, not by claiming to be his followers of Jesus, not by any set of standards or, you know, very name tags, anything like that. He says, not by anything material or physical, but by our love for one another. And he's talking not about our love for the world or people who do not follow Jesus. He's talking about the love we have for each other as followers of Christ. And I thought, you know, there's been a number of groups in history. There have been leaders, there have been groups that are very caring and loving of each other and supportive of each other. And I thought, that's how, why is this unique? Why, why is Jesus using this as the standard for how people will know that we are his? And from what scripture says, it's evidently even though other people show love and very genuine love and really care for people, there's something different about the love of Jesus, the love of God. There's something different about a love that would carry Jesus all the way to being crucified for us, giving absolutely everything for us. And evidently, if we have that kind of love, that kind of caring for each other, it's something that other people will notice. In most sense, there's something different there. These people have a different relationship. There's something that goes beyond simply being nice to each other or being common humanity or whatever other reasons we might have for a relationship. There's something different in the love that the world should see between us as Christians. And that love doesn't mean that we never correct or we never have any differences of opinions. 
doesn't mean any of that because Paul, the Apostle Paul, certainly was very direct with a lot of the Christians about where they were <clears throat> going off track. He even gives instructions for how to correct Christians who are doing something wrong. So it's not a matter that we never disagree, that we never have any differences in interpretations or policies or beliefs. But evidently this love that Jesus had for his disciples, for a group of people that had quite a few differences, very different characters, but the love that Jesus had, he asked us to have for each other. And evidently when people see that between Christians, it's going to make a difference. They're going to notice that these people who have may have very different ideas, may be completely on different sides of the political spectrum, they may have different ideas of what involves good work. They have, they have lots of different ideas about little things in life, but these people really love each other. And it's obvious that that's first. And that's what will make the difference in what other people see. And for me, this actually becomes very personal because I have to think, how often do I make my point first, then I show God's love? instead of showing God's love first, and then when the time is appropriate, or when it's loving, a loving way to do it, make my point, or state my position, if it's even necessary. I really have to think about that, because I'm very prone to making my point first. And God wants us to love each other first, and put everything else after that. And he set that example on the cross putting love for us above pain, above death, above everything to purchase our redemption, our forgiveness, our peace with God. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you this week that we have your love. And we ask that in some small way this week, we can show that love to someone else, to another brother or sister in Christ, whether it's over the phone, over a Zoom meeting, over whatever the method is, that we can show love for each other, understanding and caring for each other, and represent the love that Jesus showed his disciples, the love that we've experienced from, from Jesus. And we thank you for this and ask for your strength and your help in being loving first and having everything else come second. And we take this bread now, as Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. Take, eat in remembrance of me. And he took the cup and said, this is the blood of the new covenant, new covenant in my blood, given for us. He gave everything for us, Lord, and we just ask that we can return the love that you gave us to each other and show the world the caring and love can triumph over everything. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. May our homes be filled with dancing May our streets be filled with joy May injustice bow to Jesus As the people turn to pray From the mountain to the valley Hear our prayer Says, rise to you from the heavens to the nations. You are singing, fill the air. May 
a light shining in the darkness As we walk before the cross May your glory fill the whole earth As the water over the seas From the mountain to the valley Hear our praises rise to you From the heavens to the nations Hear our singing fill the Trinity Christian Fellowship. You are loved. I love you, and it's good to be together. We have a lot to be thankful for, so let's get praying. Great God in heaven, we're grateful for so many things you've blessed us with. Lord, we're thankful for the peace that we have right now in our country, that nothing huge happened in Washington, D.C. as far as conflict or across the different state capitals. Lord, we're also thankful we got some storms coming our way. Hopefully, Lord, some of them will leave an appreciable amount of rain and snow. Lord, please fill up our mountains with snow and our reservoirs with water and water running through the creeks and streams and rivers and flushing out the bay, Lord. Help our water table as well. Lord, we're grateful. I thank you for some people I know that after being exposed or not uh, or COVID negative, and we're thankful for that, Lord. Lord, help us in this fight against COVID, Lord, and help us as we are just ourselves to whatever the future holds to always be a people of prayer, praying just as Jesus taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Turning your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 20. Chapter 20, verse 20. Yes, Matthew 20, 20. Sorry, I just had to throw that number out there. I won't do it again. This is a story about uh, a woman who had to grab for something of power during a time of uncertainty. What do we go for when we are uncertain? What the future might hold? I remember the Peanuts cartoons. 
There was Linus. He had a security blanket, right? If he didn't have a security blanket, his world fell apart, which is kind of sad because I always viewed Linus as being one of the few characters that actually had emotional balance. So I guess that honor now goes to the dog. But what do we do when we're uncertain about the future? Sometimes we get a good comfort food and we sit down in front of a favorite show. Sometimes, at the, like at the beginning of this pandemic, we go shopping. We buy toilet paper and bottled water for some reason and uh, maybe a stack of cash just in case. Again, I understand that. We've never been through this before. Well, we have a case here in which people were feeling very uncertain in the group around Jesus. And what did they do when they were uncertain what the future held? Let's read the story, and then we'll launch into it. Verse 20, Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons, and, and kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want? he asked. She said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right, and the other at the left in your kingdom. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. Now this story itself, I'm just using as kind of a launching pad because there's a lot of neat stories before and after this that I'm taking as like a larger set. But the roots of this one story, they go into all these other surrounding stories. And it's important for us to kind of unpack the, the whole thing together. Who's the person involved here? The mother of James and John? Her name we know from other places. Her name is Salome, the wife of Zebedee. She was an awesome person. She was one of the ladies who traveled with Jesus and the disciples wherever they went, in, taking care of a lot of their needs that they had. But she was also one of the ladies who was at the foot of the cross as Jesus died, and one of the ladies who went to the tomb on Easter morning to anoint the body and discovered the resurrection had taken place. An amazing lady. She is kind of doing a story at the end of Jesus' ministry, similar to one that happened at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Remember when Jesus was at a wedding feast? And Jesus' mother came by and said, can, I, can you do a favor for me? This man has run out of wine. Put Jesus in an odd spot. In this case, this is at the end of Jesus' ministry, and this is one of the few times in which Jesus gets a request from somebody, a wonderful person, and he says, sorry, I can't help you. Wow. Well, in this story, Jesus and his group of people are down in the area called Ephraim, and they're going to be traveling towards Jerusalem, but they're not going to go into Jerusalem yet. They're going to make a quick dog dodge down to uh, uh, Jericho, down the mountain to the east, spend a few days there, a couple stories we'll touch on there, and then he's going to make the final ascent back into Jerusalem after that. But Jesus is a wanted man, and he's desperately close to where people that could actually get a hold of him. And uh, so everybody's feeling insecure. During our times of insecurity, what do we grab for? Well, let's look at some of the context that's going on in this. It makes people sometimes do crazy things. The first context is we call it the competition. Back in chapter 19, verse 16, uh, there's the story of the rich young ruler. He has three things going for him. He's rich, he's young, and he's a ruler. That's everything there. But actually, he has a lot more going for him. When he uh, talks to Jesus, he shows himself to be a very moral person, and he knows the Word of God. That's pretty cool. But he has two specific other things that are really great in his favor. First off, at this point in time, when everybody else is kind of running away from Jesus, his popularity has peaked and is plummeting rapidly, he's running towards Jesus. Literally, he was running towards Jesus. And the second thing, it says in the book of Mark chapter 10, which is Mark's version of the same story, it says Jesus loved him. Now, we know Jesus loves everybody. But for Mark, who is a kind of a cut-to-the-chase type guy, he likes to 
get to the point on all of his stories, for him to stop to talk about the emotions of the thing is kind of unusual. He's saying that Jesus really liked this guy. Can you imagine if you're one of the disciples and Mr. Perfect is now applying to be able to travel with them? Well, this guy kind of upset the apple cart, the little pecking order that they've arranged. I imagine it might cause for some people to be insecure, but he doesn't stay because Jesus says, if you want to be perfect, sell everything and follow me. But he can't do that because he's too rich. He can't bring himself to doing that. So after he leaves, Peter says something important. He says, Jesus, we have left everything to follow you. And at that point, Jesus brings up another thing that is important. It's rewards. A lot of them are kind of wondering, you know, what do we get out of this? What are the pay, what's the pay and what's the fringe benefits? Uh, in verse 28, it says this. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Wow. Now, this is important for us to grab a hold of this. Because later, when Salome shows up with James and John and talks about sitting to the right and the left in his kingdom, this is the verse she's talking about. There's a twelve thrones. And obviously, Jesus gets a throne. Here's the odd thing, I think. Jesus, in the verse just before this, talks about whoever has given up anything for him gets a hundred times as much in the kingdom of God. Then he puts on top of that thrones and ruling tribes. That's incredible. But for some reason, for Salome, evidently, she wonders, are some thrones better than others? All that other reward isn't quite enough. I don't know. It's an odd thing. But evidently, she thinks there needs to be some kind of pecking order that goes on. So, in anticipation of this, before she even says anything, Jesus says one more thing, and that's a parable on equality. Equality. Chapter 20, starting with verse 1, going through 15. It's a story about a man who owns a vineyard, and he needs some people to work in the vineyard. He hires some people at the break of day, then near the middle of the day at different times, and then finally he actually hires some shortly before quitting time. Then it's time to pay everybody all their day laborer wages. And he ends up paying the same amount to the people who were there for 10 hours as he was to the people who just went one hour. And uh, he gets criticized for that later on in verse 15. The, in the parable, it says, Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money, or are you envious because I am generous? Uh, he wants to rule by generosity, and this is a lesson to us regarding our God. He is a fairly egalitarian God. He likes equality. We are saved by grace, not by our works, not by the things we rack up. Our God gives us what we need. <sighs> He's a great God. But the Lord puts this verse, this parable in here for two reasons. Number one, the equality reason, egalitarianism. He, uh, he wants people to think less of thrones that have a pecking order. But on top of that, he wants the disciples to stop thinking of themselves as guys who are going to be sitting on thrones. And he wants them to feel a little bit more like farm workers. Migrant farm workers that are at the other end of society. Uh, when I was a kid, I was raised on a farm. And uh, on the school bus route, the migrant farm labor camp was one stop just before the bus stopped at our house. And we got on, and on our own property, we had a big uh, house building for, a, for migrants that would be working on our property as well. Matter of fact, uh, it was a barracks building that was sold by a local military base. They were decommissioning them. People would buy them, move it to their property. They'd have instant building. It's pretty cool. Actually, we bought two barrack buildings from that place. One was for the migrant laborers. The other one was our house. 
We got to live in the other one. Fix it up. A lot of happy memories there. But the Lord wants us to not think so much about all the crowns and the glory and the thrones that are ours eventually, but to think of the harvest. The work to be done on the farm. That's where our, I, our uh, attention should be. Well, before Salome shows up, there's still one more thing he's going to talk about. And we'll just summarize it by torture. He talks about torture. Verses 18 and 19, he says this. We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he'll be raised to life. Now, these are powerful words. He spends a lot more time on the death and the mocking and the flogging than he does resurrection, which is important. He's laying things on. But in that, we've got to understand when Salome shows up, she's not asking him about his death. She's not asking him about the equality in the parable. She comes up to him and says, Jesus, can we talk again about the thrones you promised? Really? That's what you want to talk about after he poured his heart out? Imagine it this way. A friend of yours comes to you and says, I just came back from the doctor's office. I'm going to die. And the way I'm going to die is going to be hard. It's going to be really hard. And you say, man, can I have your end tables? You know, the one to the right and the left of your sofa? Those will look so good in my living room. That's kind of what is happening here. She's not listening to the crucifixion. She's not listening to equality. She got hung up on the thrones. Listen, anybody who's going for, for whatever reason, a power grab, is ignoring the cross of Christ. And that's what is going on here. Well, what happens as a result of this word there? Indignation. Verse 24. The disciples are indignant as to what is happening. There's a Greek word there, agonakteo. It's an inconsequential Greek word. It means indignation. But it comes in the dictionary just, one, just before a very important word, agape. Everybody loves agape. That's the love that's unconditional. It's wonderful. Agape is wonderful. The word just before it, indignation, is kind of like 180 degrees different. It's the flare-up. I can't believe you said that. Going from, from quietness to anger in, you know, zero to 60, just like that. That's the thrust here. And the thing is, is that this word isn't used a whole lot in Scripture, but when it is being used... It's usually during these two weeks before Jesus dies. Everybody is on edge. Everybody is ticked off and ready to be ticked off. The story just before this, when the disciples are keeping the children away from Jesus, Jesus gets indignant at the disciples, says, let the little children come unto me. He was indignant at them. A little bit later when Jesus is going into Jerusalem, and they're saying, you know, uh, the children are saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Pharisees were indignant at the children. Then later that week, when Jesus is in Bethany and his feet are being anointed by a lady with expensive perfume, the disciples are indignant at the woman because she spent so much money. A lot of people being indignant. Tough time. Everybody's ready to be ticked off. This is the context of a person grabbing at power when they really shouldn't be bothering with that. What is the solution? It's very simple. Jesus calls us to service. That's what we go to when we're uncertain. Verse 25 to 28, Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must become your servant and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. What is he saying here? 
if you feel insecure, uncertain about what the future holds, the place to know you're in the center of God's will and His plan is to serve. Forget the throne. That'll come another time. Go for the basin and the towel. Go for the mop and the bucket, the broom and the dustpan, whatever metaphor you want. Find the opportunity to serve, and you as a Christian will find more security there than you will trying to grasp at straws, trying to save off that which is uncertain. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, help us to be your people. During these times that are uncertain, to be certain that we're called to be your servants. Lord, help us to bless others rather than worrying about how we ourselves are going to be blessed. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Now let's say our benediction together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.